intention tonight. The topic is forgiveness. So two weeks ago, we studied the most important topic of repentance. Without repentance, one cannot be saved and have our names written in the book of life. To be saved from our sins, one has to repent and believe in the good news message of Yeshua. I believe everybody here has done that. Repentance is changing one's mind, attitude, and purpose. So not just changing one's mind, but it's our attitude and our purpose. A person needs to change their mind about who they are and who Yeshua is. Now, once we become believers of Yeshua, then repentance plays an important role in our walk with the Lord as well. We need to continue to humble ourselves and evaluate our lives on a daily basis. We need to repent and turn away from our sinful lifestyles to improve our fellowship with the Lord. Spiritually connected to repentance is the topic of forgiveness. One of the greatest mistakes in the body of Messiah is that we believers hold on to unforgiveness. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight, forgiveness. Many times we don't forgive those who sin against us, and we hold on to the bad feelings, the unrighteousness, and what I call all the yucky stuff associated with the sin and unforgiveness. That's the unrighteousness and you know, the bad feelings of all that as well. Many times we harbor ill will against those sinners who don't confess their sins to us. Other times we tend to blame ourselves, saying it must be our fault. Or we get down on ourselves and even don't forgive ourselves when we sin against others. So tonight we shall learn that we must forgive and ask for forgiveness, no matter what happens. Just like we need to continue to repent for the rest of our lives after we've already repented for salvation. Now in Judaism, if a person sins, but then sincerely and honestly apologizes to the wronged individual and tries to rectify the wrong, the wronged individual is strongly encouraged but not required to grant forgiveness. That's where we differ. Judaism is not required, although it's strongly encouraged. Here's a quote from Maimonides. He's a famous rabbi. It is forbidden to stubbornly refuse and not allow yourself to be appeased. So it is kind of forbidden there. On the contrary, one should easily pacify and find it difficult to become angry. When asked by an offender for forgiveness, one should forgive with a sincere mind and a willing spirit. Forgiveness is natural to the seed of Israel. That's in the Mishnah Torah. And very interesting though, yes, it is forbidden, but obviously in Judaism it's accepted that we will not forgive others. And that is a very uh, uh, strong, uh, unfortunate thing that's going on in Judaism. So. In any event, I have another quote here from Sir Jonathan Sachs. He's an Orthodox rabbi, chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth. This is in the United Kingdom, Orthodox. He summarized forgiveness. He said this, It is not that God forgives, while well, human beings do not. To the contrary, we believe that just as only God can forgive sins against God, so only human beings can forgive sins against human beings. Now, this is not necessarily true, but it is what Orthodox Judaism believes. However, the issue here is that we forgive our fellow man of his sins against us. And that's where we have agreement with the rabbis as well. We do need to forgive and truly need to do it all the time. However, now, you know why Jewish people are asking for forgiveness during the 10 days of all. Just prior to Yom Kippur, Jewish people will ask forgiveness of those that have wronged them during the prior year. They need to do this first before going to God on Yom Kippur, fasting and praying for God's forgiveness for the transgressions that they have made against Him in the prior year. But the problem is that some Jewish people do not forgive, even when others come to them and ask for that forgiveness. But we do the same things, do we not? Sometimes we're doing that in our lives as well. Well, let's take a look at this topic, forgiveness. Uh, throughout the Bible, we're going to go back to the first book of the Bible. We'll open up to the book of 
Genesis, bear sheet in the Hebrew there, chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verse 15 and 21. 15 to 21. And I want you to focus now on Joseph. Joseph is forgiving his brothers. You guys know the story. The brothers sold him into slavery. And for many, many years was a slave in Egypt, in jail for a few years as well. Look what happened, though, after he became um, second in command of Egypt. Verse 15 and following here. And this is after his father now, uh, Jacob, has died. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and pay us back? in full for all the wrong which we did to him. And don't most humans think like that? Right? We all think, oh, you know what? He might have said for, he forgave us, but you know what? He might not, and he might, he might want to have to pay us back. Verse 16, and so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died, saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin." For they did you wrong. And now please forget the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And so the brothers even made a connection between uh, their father and God as well. Look, look, they said, forget the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. You know, they're saying they're servants now of God, which of course they were. Joseph wept, verse 18, when his brothers also came, fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I, uh, for am I in God's place? And as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And so after Jacob died, Joseph's brothers, they begged for forgiveness. And Joseph gave it to them lovingly. Knowing the tragedy and the tragic life that he went through for many years. And here he is, lovingly forgiving them. Joseph thinking is right in accordance with God and even Romans chapter 8 verse 28. You should know this verse by now. We've mentioned it many times, but something we need to remember up here in our, and in our hearts as well. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to His purpose. And so yes, bad things are going to happen to good people. Bad things are going to happen to good believers. And guess what we need to be doing, though? In those times, we need to be forgiving. Second Chronicles chapter 7, please turn to that set of scripture. We're going to look at some of the most famous scriptures that are recited in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11 through 14. Now, we have to understand... This is when Solomon, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to the chapter here. This is when Solomon finished the temple. And he's going to be praying unto the Lord. They're observing the feast. Verse 11, thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's palace and successfully completed all that he had planned on doing in the house of the Lord and in his palace. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon that night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. But if I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, now why would God do that? Only when the Jewish people would turn away from him and worship other gods, then he would judge. That's what he's saying. So if I'm judging the the Jewish people, look at verse 14. This is the king for us tonight. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And I know that you've heard this verse, especially in Christ. 
Christendom many, many times, and they all talk about the congregation, the Messianic community being the people that are spoken of here, but the actual context tells us talking about the Jewish people. Jewish people back in the land at the time of Solomon. And he says, if they were to fall away from the Lord, they're going to worship other gods. And he judged them. And then he says, if they humble themselves, they pray, they seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then God will hear from them and forgive their sin and will heal their land. And so, yes, we can make an application to us. There is a formula here. The Lord requires his children to perform a number of actions of the heart before forgiveness is even granted. He says here, be humble, number one. Be humble. Recognize that we do sin at times. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in our times of trouble, especially when seek the Lord when good times are happening. Praise his name when you've got good times. And then he says, repent from the evil and then pray confessing sin. And so when we do these things, we come back to the Lord. Say, yes, Lord, I agree with you. I've sinned. Please forgive me. I confess. I agree with you. That's humble. That's humility. That's seeking the Lord and it's repenting as well. Turn away. Changing your mind about your sin and saying it's evil. Then what is God going to do? God's going to hear. He's going to hear our prayer. He's going to forgive. And then he will heal. He will heal our hearts. And that's the key to the verse there at the end. It says it will heal their land. Well, you know, the church doesn't have any land. So this isn't talking to the church. It's talking to the Jewish people and their land. But the application for us is he will heal our hearts. And that's what's important, right? That's what's important. When people sin against us, and when we sin against others, we need to forgive both ways. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Now turn to Psalm, Psalm 32, Book of Psalms. Psalm 32, 1 through 7. We're going to see David crying out unto the Lord. He's got some sin issues in his life. David was certainly not a perfect uh, Jewish king there. He had a lot of sins going on in his life. Uh, and he actually killed a man and took his wife. And so the belief is at this time when, is when he is now asking for that forgiveness because of that. Can you imagine as king he did that? And, but God forgave him. This is a psalm of David. It's a mass skill. And uh, that possibly means like a contemplative uh, uh, psalm. So it's something that we need to have our minds focus on. We're going to look at the first seven verses here. And he says this, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. And so he tells us right from the beginning, we're blessed if we're able to confess our sins unto the Lord. Verse 3, but look, verse 3 and 4, where David talks about what happened to him prior to his confession. He says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah, he says. And so his body was wasting away because the sin was not confessed. The sin was still aggravating his body, his heart, his soul. And then we see the victory in verse 5 to 7 here. David says, I acknowledge my sin to thee and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. The guilt there is, like I said before, all the yucky stuff of the sin. You forgive the sin with all the stuff that's associated with it, all that garbage. And therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not reach him. 
So he says, yes, yes, confess your sins and then you'll be healed. But go to the Lord in a time that he can be found. So don't wait, he's saying, don't wait. Once you know that you sinned against somebody, go and confess the sin. Don't wait till the next day. Don't wait till the next week. Because maybe you're not going to be able to watch you at that point. Verse 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou dost preserve me from trouble. Thou dost surround me with the songs of deliverance. And there's the joy. Uh, the joy after confession. Because then you're healed. Your heart. God takes away all that yucky stuff, like I said. So when we sin and confess our sin to the Lord, we are blessed. But when we sin and don't confess our sin to others and to God, then God disciplines us. That's what was happening to David here. He said his body was wasting away. He was groaning all day long. So our bodies can groan, can waste away. We lose strength as well. It sounds very similar and familiar to New Covenant scriptures. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn to chapter 11, 1 Corinthians. We're going to look at verse 28 and 32. This is the famous set of scripture that's talking about taking communion, the Lord's Supper. And Shaul is ending this section here. He says, but let a man examine himself. And this is prior to partaking of the Lord's Supper. We, too, we are to examine ourselves, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. That means died. So those who took communion, who did not examine themselves correctly and took communion in an unworthy manner, some of them were sick, some were just weak, some died. So God holds communion very strongly to his hearts. And then in verse 31, 32, but if we judge ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. And so the Lord disciplines us so that we would repent and that we would confess our sins. So that we won't get judged along with the world. So the application here is to when we sin and we do not confess, well then our sin and the effects of that sin will build up in our lives. First we can become weak, then sick, and some even have died. I know believers who took communion in improper ways over the last 30 years, and they got physically worse because of it. But the point is, and the aspect here is judge ourselves rightly when we find out we've got issues in life that we need to confess to one another, confess to the Lord. And if there's extenuating circumstances, they can come and talk to me and I'd be happy to help figure them out. Matthew chapter 18. And what I meant by that was, you know, sometimes people have died and you weren't able to talk with them you know, prior to them dying. And so, yes, you might feel remorse about not being able to talk. So, well, they moved away and you never saw them again. You don't know where they are. You can't contact them. And there's just ways to deal with that as well. Matthew 18, chapter, chapter 18, verse 21 and 22. Peter had a very unusual question uh, that he's asking Yeshua. It says, Then Kepha came and said to, said to him, said to Yeshua, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Yeshua said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. And so the context here is that Yeshua is talking to his Talmudim, specifically uh, Kepha here, Peter, but he tells them to forgive those who sin against them up to 490 times. Now, are we supposed to be counting the sins that are, that are uh, committed against us? Absolutely not. So the idea here is to always forgive those who sin against us. Always, just always forgive. Have a forgiving heart. Yeshua then spoke of a parable about a king who forgave the debt of a slave. 
The slave, after being forgiven a great debt by the king, then went out to violently collect a much smaller debt from another slave. He had no mercy on the other slave, even though he received great mercy himself from the king. So the idea here is that we are to take the Lord's merciful forgiveness of our own sins and appropriate it in life to others. How many people here have people that have sinned against you, even recently have done bad things against you? You can raise your hand, it's okay. Yeah, I know there are some in here. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we are to forgive others even if they don't ask for their forgiveness. Why? Because Yeshua has forgiven us of all of our sins. And we don't want to hold on to unforgiveness. We're going to talk about what unforgiveness does to us in just a little while. Then the king said to the evil slave in verses 33 to 35. Look at how he responded here. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? The obvious answer is yes, right? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. So shall my, here, listen to this verse now, verse 35. So shall my heavenly Father also do to you. If each of you does not forgive his brother from your hearts. That's a really good incentive to forgive. Right? We are to forgive others from our heart. We are to have mercy on others who are sinners just like us. Because Yeshua had mercy on us to forgive us of all of our sins. So if we forgive, then the Lord will forgive us too. But if we don't forgive, then what happens? And the Lord will not forgive us our sins, but not for salvation, for sanctification. It's in our fellowship with Him, and we will be disciplined in the process. Salvation is not the issue here, but sanctification with the Lord and with our brethren. And so we don't want to be in what Pastor Cooper always called the woodshed with the Lord. We don't want to be out there because that's where judgment happens. That's where discipline happens. So there are three great incentives to forgive here. That we should learn to have mercy on the sinner because we're all in the same boat. Yeah, some people's sins are worse than others. But we're all sinners, right? And we've all been forgiven. And so we need to be able to forgive others. So the first one is to have mercy on the sinner. The second is to be forgiven by the Father in our walk with Him. And the third is to not be disciplined by the Lord. So averting discipline is a good reason to forgive. Yeah, our kids always try to avert their discipline when we're going to discipline you're going to spank them on the butt. They start what? They start running away, right? Yeah, they're trying to get away. They don't want to be disciplined. Nobody wants to be disciplined. However, when it comes to forgiveness, we certainly do not. I know a number of folks who did not follow the Lord's directions here and they lost everything in life. God amazingly took everything away from them. Just amazing. It was amazing to watch it as well. Let's turn to Luke chapter 15. We're going to look at a parable now. One of Yeshua's parables. Luke 15, verse 21 through 32. This is a parable of the prodigal son. You guys know, you know this. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. Hang on a second. Prodigal son. Got a little prideful, asked for his inheritance too early. And he wasted it all, and he almost died in a foreign land. So we pick up the story where the father has already hugged and kissed his son, who was approaching the household from afar. So the son woke up, and we can see how he is fulfilling the Lord's requirements here, verse 21 through 24. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. So he goes first to God, I have sinned against God, but also in your sight, meaning in front of you as well, Lord, uh, my father. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf 
kill it and let us eat and be merry. For the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to be merry. And so the son fulfilled the Lord's requirements for asking for forgiveness. First of all, he was humbled. He sought the Lord. He was sitting there eating the crumbs of the pig's food. And so he humbled himself in that respect. He sought the Lord. He repented from his evil to his father. And he said, I'll go back and I will confess my sin to my dad and to God. The father obviously forgave him with his great joy because now his son had returned. And it's interesting that... Look at verse 22 once again. He said, bring out the best robe, put a ring on his head, and sandals on his feet. Well, the robe was a sign of the birthright. And so his father was, in a sense, giving his son uh, the birthright back to him. The ring was a sign of authority. And his shoes were a sign of sonship. And so he gave everything back to his son that his son gave up as he left with his inheritance. What a very rich uh, parable here that Yeshua was providing in this wonderful uh, way of forgiving. Verse 25 to 32 now. So that was an older son, and I want you to focus on the older son that was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things might be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has kept the fatted cat because he has received him back safe and sound. And you can say he's received him back as a saved believer now. And he became angry. The older son, he was angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began entreating him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected the command of yours. And that you have never given me a kid that I might be merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came, he has devoured your wealth with harlot. You killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to my child, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we have to be merry and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live. And he was lost and has been found. So when the well-behaved son heard about the other son coming back, guess what? He was jealous. He was not forgiving. He was harboring bad feelings towards his brother. But what about the father? The father immediately forgave his son. He didn't harbor those bad feelings, and so that's why he was rejoicing. And the older son was not, because he had the bad feelings inside, harboring against his brother. And this is what we need to be mindful of, how we react and act when people sin against us as well. And so this is unforgiveness. He obviously did not forgive his brother of his sins against his father and family. So we can see how affected he is towards being fleshly rather than being godly. He reacted in a very fleshly way, and yet his father acted in a very godly way. And he even saw him from afar and was like, that's my son. He's coming home. Praise the Lord. So there's an instant forgiveness there in his heart. I love this parable because it shows the dichotomy of forgiveness and unforgiveness here. Let's turn to chapter 5 of Matthew, the Beatitudes of Yeshua. Some say the greatest sermon on earth for all time. And uh, I, would, I would put it right up there as one of the greatest, yes. Maybe even the greatest. You know, it starts out there, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It just keeps on going. Blessed art thou, blessed art thou. We're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, verse 24, though. He says, And therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering there before the altar, and go your way. First 
being reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. So be reconciled with your brother before you offer your sacrifice at the altar. So the idea here is that we are to go to our offended brother or sister and confess our sins before we go to the Father to worship God. Before we go and worship the Lord, we are to take care of our issues and sins in life. Jump to the next chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. You should continue in the Beatitudes here. It says, if you, uh, for if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. And so after the Lord's teaching of his Talmudim to pray the Lord's Prayer, he teaches them how to stay in good fellowship with the Lord. If we forgive others, well, then the Lord will forgive us, and we're in fellowship with the Lord, no problems, right? But if we don't forgive others, then the Lord will not forgive our sins. And so it's speaking of fellowshiping with the Lord and our over-spiritual well-being. If we don't forgive others, we hold on to that unforgiveness. It's going to affect us and our hearts and our soul as well. It's going to affect our person as well, too. But more so, it's going to affect us. And so that's one of the great reasons to forgive others. You don't have to necessarily do it to their face, especially if you can't do that, but you go to God and tell God you forgive them. 2 Corinthians, now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. This is another great verse, especially for new believers. Verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man is in Messiah, he is a new creature. A creature, not a creature. Creature, there you go. I was saying uh, creature and creation at the same time. Huh? That's a new word, creation, yeah, creatures. Whatever. He is a new creature. We'll cut that out, right? We'll just chop that one right out of the video. I don't know we'll do it. Okay, let's start over with verse 17. Therefore, is any, if any man is in the sight, he is a new creature. The old things pass away. The old new things have come. And so when we become believers, we'll be sure that all of a sudden our whole life is now new. New thoughts, new words, new actions, new purpose. Everything in life is now new. And God says, get rid of the old, don't let the old back in. And that's part of the problem that we do. We let that old man come back in, creep in, and start to take over. Get rid of that old man and that old woman. Because it's dead and died. So old things pass away. New things have come. Verse 18. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Messiah and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And so each and every one of us has a purpose. We have the ministry of reconciliation. What does that exactly mean? Well, look at verse 19. It says, namely, that God was in Messiah reconciling the world to himself, not counting their, tr their trespasses against them, and he has committed us to the word of reconciliation. And so our jobs, each and every one of us, is to reconcile mankind to God in some form or another. You want to know what God's will is for your life? Well, reconcile the world to God. How do you do that? Well, you preach the good news message. That's one way. You show God's love in another way. I was in a I was in a store a long time ago, and this lady and I were both going to grab some bag, you know those bags that come off the for, for fruit, you know, they, they pull the things. And she was grabbing it, and I was grabbing it. I said, Oh, go right ahead. She said, Oh, chivalry is still here. She went and grabbed her bag and then I grabbed my bag. And I said, I said, praise the Lord, she was around because of Yeshua, Mashiach. And let you go first. Because Jesus loves you, and Jesus loves me. And that was it. She said, thank you, and we walked, we walked our ways. But what did I do? I'm helping her to be reconciled to God. Whether she's a believer or not, I don't know. I just assumed she wasn't, but it doesn't matter. I'm helping her in a little tiny way to reconcile her to God. Because I shared... God 
is Jesus. But I don't know. My old self would have been like, get out of here, lady. I'm going first. Maybe, maybe not. But you know the difference. You see that. I would have tried to beat her first, you know, when I ran into the other end of the <laughs> but that's the point. So even the little things that we do in life, the little things that you do to other people, showing God's love, that helps to reconcile people unto God. Verse 20. I didn't read verse 20, did I? No, verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors from Messiah, as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Messiah, be reconciled to God. So God is entreating the world through us to Yeshua. All right, I said that a little backwards. But God is, is entreating us to help the world to come to Yeshua. That's a better way of saying it. So we're ambassadors from Messiah. We're called to make reconciliation between God and mankind. How do we do this personally? We confess our sins to one another and we also forgive. But you can help other people to see that they're sinners as well. Turn to 1 John 1, 8 through 10. This is one of my favorite scriptures in evangelizing as well. 1 John 1, 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Well, I should have asked the question first. Anybody say they have no sin? Nobody raises their hands. Because if you do say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourselves and the truth is in you. The truth of the fact that you're saying you're not a sinner, that's that you don't have any sin. Then that's the case here. My grandmother used to tell us that all the time, that she never sinned. That was my Jewish grandmother. And later in life, she found out that she was a sinner, and she finally got saved towards her deathbed. So we praise the Lord for that. <laughs> I met a young man this past semester on campus. He was on campus to preach the gospel. He was open air preaching, and he actually stopped by our table before he started preaching. And he told me in our conversation that he did not sin anymore called entire sanctification. You can look it up. It's a theology where some Christians around this world believe that they get to a certain point in their life where they say, hey, I don't sin anymore. I don't believe it's true, of course, because of this verse right here. If you say you have no sin, well, then you're deceiving yourself. The truth is all in us. And freedom comes when you confess that fact. When you agree with God, then the grace is bestowed upon us, you see. That's how it works. God's grace will come upon us when you say, yes, Lord, I have sinned. Forgive me of that sin and help me to repent from it. God's grace comes upon us. He heals us of all that unrighteousness that's inside you know, because of it. So that young man was deceived, and the truth was not in him. And so if he's teaching other people, that kind of theology, well, there's a whole lot of folks that shouldn't be listening to him. But, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous or just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so when we agree with God that we have sinned, we have sins in our life, he's faithful. That means he always forgives when we confess our sins to him. He is just to be able to forgive us and then to take away all the yucky stuff out of the mind. All the stuff that's associated with this and all the guilt. And let me tell you, we all got guilt, right? You don't have to raise your hand, but I know you got guilt and you're guilty. Not just the sins, just the things you've done. But he cleanses us of all that so we are clean inside. And that's the issue. We need to be walking like we're clean. You see? And that's why we're having this teaching tonight. We need to be walking like we're clean all the time. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. We don't have the truth and we make God a liar if we say we have sinned. So that would have been a great verse to get to that young man who said he hadn't been sinning anymore. Reveals 
this section of Scripture reveals that when we confess our sins, God forgives us of all our sins and all the right unrighteousness that comes into our lives because of those sins. These are the guilty feelings, the anxiety, the bad feelings that we have because of people's sin against us and because of our own sins as well. We have that physical tiredness, sickness can, uh, can possibly also be in our lives as well. Here's an important concept. Here's an important concept. When you forgive others, that was good timing, wasn't it? This is an important concept. When you forgive others, you are being spiritually, emotionally, physically healed of all the mishigas in your life connected to the sin. Now, not every single physical ailment is going to be healed just because you confess your sin. But here is the point. When you forgive others, you're being spiritually, emotionally, and sometimes physically healed of all the mishigas connected to the sin. This is the main reason for forgiving, so that you can be spiritually healed inside, and the other person can be healed too. And that they can also repent from their offenses. So both are then being helped by God to be healed inside and grow to more maturity in our walk with Yeshua. So it's a win-win situation when we confess our sins and when we forgive others of their sins. You can't go wrong when you do it. That's the whole point. James chapter 5, verse 13. Check that verse, uh, that scripture out, please. James chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. Here comes now a physical aspect to forgiveness. James 5, verse 13 to 16. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the congregation and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and if, his, if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So sometimes physical problems are brought about because of unconfessed sins. So we need to confess our sins to one another, meaning confess to the person we sinned against and ask for forgiveness. We should also always be ready to be merciful and to forgive as well. And here's an important statement here, so remember this as well. You see, if you remember Yeshua forgave you of all your sins, past, present, and future, then how could, how could you forgive my brother or sister who has sinned against me when Yeshua has already forgiven them? Let me say that over again. You see, if you remember Yeshua forgave you of all your sins, past, present, and future, then how could I not forgive my brother or sister who has sinned against me when Yeshua has already forgiven them? their sins. See, the issue is we hold on to our unforgiveness, then we are basically telling the Lord of our ways of unforgiveness are better than His ways of forgiveness. Let me say that one again. If we hold on to unforgiveness, we're basically telling the Lord our ways of unforgiveness are better than His ways of forgiveness. And let me tell you, that's a little bit, right? When we become a mature believer in Yeshua, we must become forgivers and ask for forgiveness when we sin against others. We forgive for many different reasons. To receive our own healing from the hurt of sin. To help the other person to be healed from their hurt of sin. And to help the other person to repent from their sinful ways. So when we forgive others, it helps them to repent from their ways. And then to receive the freedom and the spirit that comes from the bondage of sin. Sin has bondage over us into spiritual uh, bondage. And so when you forgive, then that bondage is broken. When we ask for forgiveness, we need to be number one, humble. Number two, seeking the Lord. And number three, having a repentant heart. So then let's start practicing forgiving others and being forgiven by others if you haven't already been doing it. 
And this is how God's grace works in our life in a dramatic way. Amen? Amen. And so I hope to hear of some victories when uh, my beautiful bride and I return in two weeks. Let's pray. Father in heaven of Amen. We do love you, worship, and we do praise you, Lord. We thank you for this wonderful gift that you have given to all of us believers that we can be forgiven. Forgiven of our sins, yes, we still sin in our lives, and there's no point in life here on earth when we will not be having any sin in our lives. There is no truth to entire sanctification, Lord, because we have the sin nature in our bodies, oh Lord, and it continues to fight against us all the time. And that's where grace comes in when we confess our sins. He's faithful and just. God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So that we can come back into fellowship with the Lord and we'll walk with Him. And so we need to have this attitude that God has. God always forgives our sins when we confess our sins and repentance. We need to have this attitude of no others when they, when they sin against us. So help us to do this, O Lord God, and help us to have victory over unforgiveness. Maybe we're thinking of people in our past lives here that have sinned against us and have done some terrible things against us. We need to confess. We need to confess that, yes, they have sinned against us, and Lord, that we need to forgive them. Maybe you sinned against somebody else, and you need to have your sins forgiven. You need to go to them and ask for forgiveness as well. And so, Lord, help us to do these things. Help us to grow strong in you and the power of your might. And give us your strength to be able, and the boldness to be able to forgive and ask for forgiveness, Lord. We do love you, Lord, and we worship you, and we praise you. In the mighty name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, we pray. Amen.